All right, everyone, we have this week chemical and physical properties lab report. And in general, it is going to be a labeling nightmare. So just make sure you keep things labeled. Um, so we also have a lot of good tips. Dr. Christopherson, she's been doing this a long time. So uh, she sent an email with some tips. And what I'm going to recommend as I go over these tips and sort of why we have them on, this is the lab report. Right before that, it's got a notes page. So I'm going to make these bullet points so that you have them in lab for you to reference when you're there. And the first one is with the Bunsen burner. So we're going to have to check the Bunsen burners for leaks. It's actually fairly easy to do. Um, in lab, we have gas and nitrogen. Nitrogen won't explode, you know, it's in the air. So what I'm going to recommend is first hook your Bunsen burner to the nitrogen, turn it on and run the back of your hand along your hose, look for cracks on the hose. Um, of course, if you've got the hose hooked up to nitrogen, there'll be nitrogen coming out of the Bunsen burner because that's ultimately where we want the flame. But the hose itself is sort of where we're going to just sort of, especially the back of your hand will be sensitive to any leaks. If you think there is something, I'm going to contact Allie Hearn and see if she can um, get like a little spray bottle or, you know, I've got one up in lab that I might bring down. And uh, if you think you have a leak, we can check it by putting soapy water on that part of the hose that you think is leaking. And if bubbles form, then you have a leak. And again, we're doing this all with nitrogen. So it really doesn't matter if we're leaking nitrogen into the air in any quantity. Uh, but that way you can feel safe about your hose, your Bunsen burner and everything that it's hooked up and it's going to run perfectly fine. So that is how we're going to check. And then um, if you have a concern, we can put some bubble soap on it. And actually you've got soap in lab, you know, it's just um, soapy water. So you can just get some soap that they have, rub it on your hands and gloves, rub it along the hose and look for a leak. Same thing works with car tires and bike tires. If you're growing up and getting to be on your own, need to find a leak, put some soapy water on it. Okay. Um, and then the, the other way that you can sort of sense leaks is you can actually smell it. They put um, a sulfur containing molecule in gas these days so that you can sort of smell it. And so if, you smell that, don't worry, but we're first testing it with nitrogen. So doing that. Um, as for, that was the first bullet point. The next one is complete each section before moving on. And that includes working with your unknown. So far in all our labs, we have done all these tests and then we get to the unknown last. In this lab, we're going to do section one heat. Test your unknown at the same time that you're testing all the other ones. Test it first, just get it out of the way, see what happens. And then you can be going through and be like, oh, it matches this one in a uh, reaction or whatnot. Like test the unknown first, I, it doesn't matter, but you want to do all your heat, then move on to solubility. Test the solubility of everything, including your unknown. Test, does it react or dissolve in an acid is the last section then does it react or dissolve with a base? Those are the four sort of experiment sections in this lab. And make sure you test it on your unknown before moving on to the other sections. Next bullet point for um, to put on there is heat. When you're testing if these things will burn or decompose or melt, um, you only re need a small amount. This is a visual observation. And so um, she suggests like a, a match size head amount. Really, it's just like, how much can you, how much do you need to see? It, you don't need like a size of your thumb amount in order to be able to see it. Um, matchstick head is actually a good size, but it's just, you need enough to see a visual change. A single crumb, you know, my eyesight's not gonna be that good now. If we want to start burning stuff under a microscope, I guess it could work, but we're not doing that. So you need a very small amount just so you can see. Now, I've um, 
seen a lot of people having problems with getting a small amount and pretend this is my scupula and I've got a beaker or a storeroom jar or something. And essentially this is what happens. You tip this, you shove the scoop in, you get stuff on it and you're like, holy cow, that's a lot. And so you tip it and it all just slides right off. Here's the tip that you're going to do. You're gonna stick it in there and scoop it. Like this is, this is held sideways, it's not gonna spill out unless it's all the way full, um, in which case you don't have to. But yeah, you, know, you got that, you get it, and then you get on the tip. And then what you do is you just, you start tapping your scoop on like the side of the jar. And it's just gonna slowly like jiggle it to the end and fall off until everything has fallen off until that little bit that you want. Um, this is also a good way to slowly add stuff to balances. Um, when we get to that, we haven't done yet, but it's what I do in lab all the time is I'll get a little bit and I'll be really close to the amount that I want. And I'll have my scoop with the stuff on it and I'll just like, uh, most likely on the, the glass wall of the balance. It's, it's a very light tap, just a little, little tap and that little vibration is gonna cause your stuff if it's still sliding down, slowly come off the end. And that's how you can get down to a small amount because Again, I've seen this so many times. People scoop it up. They're like, I got a bunch. I need to pour some off. They do a little tilt and it all goes off and then you got to start over. So try the tapping method. I'll win a Nobel Prize for it, I'm sure. No, this one's already done. Okay. Um, the other thing that she stresses and the important thing with when she stresses things, there's a very good reason for it. And um, I'm guessing I haven't seen the rubric yet, but it's going to be to get all the points. Like we want you to get the points for these things. Terminology. So use the correct terminology. For heating, there's going to be several things. It can melt. It can dehydrate. And that's when it's going to be like popping like popcorn. Decomposition. That's where um, it's, it's, it's basically like just burning. It's breaking into smaller parts. We'll go over some of these things. Um, or it's inert, nothing's happening. Um, but when you're describing it, use that terminology. And this goes for everything else. Like we're doing so many visual observations and people come up to me and be like, I, how, how would I describe this? And what's, what, uh, and uh, use the terms in the manual because those are the terms that are being looked for on the rubric. And so then we don't have to like translate, oh, the said this versus this. It's like, no, you just use the same words. Um, so make sure to use the terms melt, dehydration, decomposition, and inert. Um, while we're on that, we might as well look at what those things are. So screen share, desktop, Always this trippy thing with streaming live to YouTube where there it goes. Um, no, no. Okay. Decomposition, things break apart. I like these examples. I don't even know if we're using, are we using zinc? No, we're using zinc oxide. What about aluminum trioxide? No, we're not using these compounds. Um, but the the thing here that is very common with things that um, decompose decomposition reactions is heat. So this is essentially like you're burning something. But you can see here, there's some like easily to recognize gas molecules that can pop off of this. This CO3, well, CO2, that's carbon dioxide. That can pop off and just leave zinc oxide. Um, you got a whole bunch of oxygen here. What if you start burning this, you could easily potentially start popping off some oxygens. Um, and so uh, think of that, like if you can see something that has a whole bunch of oxygen uh, attached to something, it could pop off as that. Or if you see CO3 can easily decompose into CO2. Um, so that's just to, to sort of be like, oh, I could potentially see something here. Um, and, and there's other things, but that's a decomposition. Um, the other one was melting. I hope you guys know what melting is. I'm not going to pull up something for melting. Um, dehydration. So dehydration 
hydrate, that's water. And what happens is hydrate crystal. Let's just pick something. Um, there's all sorts of crystals and solids that form. And when these crystals and solids form, there'll be itty bitty water molecules that end up being incorporated inside the crystal structure. And here they're showing a cool example. Anhydrous cobalt chloride is blue, whereas cobalt chloride hexahydrate, meaning it has six waters in that crystal structure um, trapped in it, it's actually pink. And we're doing cobalt, we're not. So I can talk about this one. So um, essentially with something like cobalt chloride hexahydrate, if you start putting heat into it, the water that is trapped in that crystal structure is going to come off. The cobalt and the chloride, they're not going to vaporize. They're not going to turn into gases and fly away, but water can easily turn into steam. And um, I would guess if you were to start heating this, you'd see a really cool color change. Maybe this will be thrown into this lab in future years. Um, cobalt's a transition metal, so we have to worry about waste disposal. It can't go down the drain. Um, but that's the type of thing. And for all of these things here, um, they're not giving us any clues. Like technically when you buy this, it would say if it's anhydrous or it's a hexahydrate, they're not giving us that clue here. Um, Cause if you saw water in it, then you'd know that it would uh, be able to be heated and you'd kick the water off. Um, but that's it, all that is gonna be happening. And so if, if you're confused, like, why is it doing it? Just, just know that they're not showing the water in the crystal structure that is there, but if it does this, it'll be doing it. And crystals are like solid. So you can think of like a popcorn kernel. That's why it describes it as popping. Um, popcorn kernels, they've got like this hard shell on the outside. And as you heat up a kernel, it's got a bunch of moisture water on the inside that's turning into steam. And eventually enough steam builds up for it to just pop. So that's what you're looking for when you're looking for a solid that is dehydrating. It's because you're putting the heat in, the water in the crystal is turning into steam causing that crystal to pop. So we got that term. What was the other term? Uh, dehydration, decomposition, melt, and inert. Inert means it's not going to do anything. Um, like if you, they don't have it, but aluminum. Like if I put aluminum foil, stuff you got in your kitchen, into a flame, it's still going to be aluminum foil pulled out. It's just like straight metals. You know, it's not going to do anything. So, um, stop screen share. <clears throat> the other tip, um, solubility. Make sure you do a small amount. Now, uh, some of this large volume solubility stuff that we've done in the past, this is where I've seen a lot of people sort of struggling with getting a small amount. So make sure you're doing that nice little tapping technique where you get it on the scoop and then you just sort of tap it to the side wall of whatever and get a small amount only. Now, the reason for this, why is it so important? Well, when it comes to solubility, you know, anything can be made insoluble if you have enough of it. Sugar is incredibly soluble, so easy to get into water. But if I took a bathtub size amount of sugar and tried to fit it into my coffee cup of water, it's not going to fit. It's it just, there's no way to fit a bathtub full of sugar into a coffee cup of water. And you'd be like, oh my goodness, it's insoluble. Well, no, you just, you don't have, you have too much of the solid. So that's why it's important to make sure you have a small amount so you can actually see if um, it dissolves or if it doesn't dissolve, like it's, it's not gonna go anywhere. And some of the solubility tests where people have issues in the past has been essentially, um, it is, soluble you just maxed out the system the water can't hold anymore um and so it did dissolve down um you can also swirl it and stir it and mix it up um various ways of mixing it up and the next thing acids 
the the thing to look at is with this there's going to be looks like four um, possible observations you want to say see all four for a single thing but these are the things to record because these are the most likely the words i haven't seen the rubric but they're most likely the words that are going to be you know minus a half point if you don't have this word minus a half point if you don't have this word and so for the acids you're going to want to try to put in these words bubbles odors soluble insoluble um and that's what we're looking for to see if there's uh chemical reactions occurring would be bubbles and odors um soluble and insoluble that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a chemical reaction it just means it's dissolving could mean a chemical reaction um but that's not so much important as getting the observations now the things that we're adding the acid to are these solubility tests that we do. We can split them and use half for the acid test, half for the base test. But this is really interesting. I want you to realize why we're doing this. Um, says in the lab, if you don't see anything, add just acid. Now, why would that be? Well, with the solubility test, um, we're taking our solid and we're putting it in water. And depending on how much water you have and how much solid you have, um, it could be too dilute. Like if you did a really, really good job of getting a very small amount of solid and you put it into a decent amount of water, maybe there is supposed to be a gap. Oh, sorry. Alexa is interrupting. She's saying it's time for scriptures. She's going to say it again. And I don't have editing technology to know how to edit these videos must be 6 30. anyway kids are in the top so we're not doing scriptures right now um back to this sorry for the interruption um yes so the volume of the liquid and the amount of solid that you put into it matters and if you need to see a chemical reaction like bubbles forming or precipitate or something like that in the next step, then if you put a very small amount of your solid in that liquid, there won't be enough. So essentially what they're saying is we're just gonna try it with just straight acid. Um, and that way you'll get really clear results. And if you see any ambiguity, if you're uncertain at all, just go for the straight acid and solid um, combination because then you don't have to worry about the dilution did it get too dilute to see a reaction so keep that in mind um base test and i think this is the same thing since i'm reading her email real fast okay so again it's similar since the precipitate is hard to see um yeah so it's a similar idea where the um, the reaction that you're supposed to see can be difficult to see and if you're using those solutions that you made from the solubility test it might be too dilute because perhaps you did too good of a job of only using a small amount it's almost sounding like you should just not use those solubility tubes, um, but do what the manual says uh, first. And then if it doesn't work, then use the, the fresh stuff, essentially. Um, and that might be because some of these things, even in small quantities, react violently, and we don't want things going crazy. So always try the dilute stuff first. So it does make sense. Do the dilute stuff first. And if uh, nothing explodes, then uh, and you don't see anything and you're wondering if you're supposed to see something, try using the, the more concentrated stuff to see if, if there is supposed to be something. Now, the other interesting thing is we learn about this term, um, the amphoteric, 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 
um you know after i looked it up i was like oh yeah i've seen this um so we're going to screen share again to discuss what this thing means so we don't need that um here we go so um effect of acid base equilibrium salts i love this chemistry libre textbook and ph and you really don't need to know any of this stuff but when we get to down here acid basic acidic basic amphoteric oxides and hydroxides and what this is is there's a section on the periodic table where it's sort of in between on electronegativity where you know they can uh, accept electrons or donate electrons for all these different compounds um and so basically like these oxides they make basic solutions when you put this oxide in water it'll make a basic solution these oxides when you put them in water the green ones when you put them in water they'll make an acidic solution and then right here these guys can actually go both ways and what this uh, ends up looking like is you can get precipitates that form and then go away as you like increase the amount of base or acid and chromium was an example that I found. I actually don't see chromium on this. That's where it is chromium on the periodic table. Sure, it's right under my nose. I am looking for a CRN chromium. Okay, it's up there. Anyway, um, come back to chrome. Chrome chromium solubility. No, no. Uh, well, this is this is an example for aluminum. We're not using aluminum hydroxide. So, but essentially, the the molecules sort of create this like crystal lattice that form precipitate, but as you add more of the hydroxide, it'll go away. Um, so here you have Al with three water molecules and three hydroxide molecules, and they just line up in this like perfect chain lattice that makes it uh, sort of clump out of solution, makes whatever you'd see. Um, and then as you add more hydroxide, you can sort of get it to all back into the water so that could be what we're looking for but nope nope did it go away i had a cool video i thought oh no just lower down on this so um on that same web page there's this really cool video where they're using chromium and um they're sort of showing a similar thing where you can, I think it's like, it looks like this. And then as you add base, you'll get this cloudy something or other forming. And then ultimately, as you add more base, it turns into a light green type of color thing. Um, and this cloudiness is sort of what we're looking for, for this uh, thing that appears and goes away. And so, this is hard to see, so it's best to um, have essentially large quantities of both the solid that we're testing and the base to make it happen. And I think that's really what happens with the solubility. You're trying to see if a small amount will dissolve and disappear. And, and then for both the acid and base, you're trying to see if there's a reaction for a reaction. You need to have enough of a quantity to make it visual. And so it's important to sort of uh, increase the quantities when you're doing these acid base tests. Um, that's why she suggests making fresh solutions if you don't see anything. And then see if you add base and it clears and goes away. Um, other reminders, uh, you guys have been doing great. And uh, no, like you have your own, your own unknown, your own unknowns. Don't share them. Uh, if we see similar unknown numbers, we have to flag it. And uh, we, you guys have been great. We haven't had any issues. Um, 
waste is the other thing to mention. The liquids then go down the drain. These are very, very common salts and things like that. Um, I've been teaching a little bit about things to worry about. We're not working with things like chromium, which is a transition metal. If I, am I still screen sharing? Yeah, chromium right there. These transition metal things, these are not good to go down the drain, but we're doing a whole bunch of uh, this stuff with a whole bunch of um, oxygen and sulfur and different things and um, those types of salts. They can go down the drain, pretty, pretty stable. Um, and the solids, there'll be a solids waste container to put those into. Um, and that sums up the major notes. Sorry, my cat is showing up. I'm getting all sorts of interruptions. Uh, I really feel bad that I don't have more time to like be professional about these things, but I want to help you guys and you guys soak up so much knowledge um, that I'm, I feel like I'm an out of shape track coach trying to keep up with a whole bunch of like young energetic track runners. Uh, I, I saw that in junior high. I had a track coach who uh, drove around in a car while we ran through Monticello. But it's kind of how I focus. You guys soak up so much. And I wish I had more time to get this information to you in a better format. But thank you for your patience with me. Um, so other than that, the other things to think about is what is the, the purpose of this lab and what information would help prepare you for this. So how do you earn points? You do the quiz and you do this. And for me, I want you to know that I want you to be safe in lab and I want you to get points on the lab part itself. And so with that, that's what I want you to come prepared to do when you're thinking about stuff for the quiz. Am I going to ask you something like, um, what size test tube are we putting things in? No, or any like generic procedural thing. No, I'm not gonna ask those things. Um, but anything related to helping you be safe and helping you be prepared to answer the questions, use the correct terms, um, know how process of elimination works, uh, anything that would help you is the type of thing that I want you to study and prepare, be prepared to do for the quiz. Uh, so be safe in lab and be prepared. Um, I won't ask you about like, no, I won't say that, never mind. Um, but, but like the generic procedural stuff or like what chemical, what's the chemical name of this and things like that. Uh, there, there's stuff that you just have in the lab book, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, then let's look at what other things. Nitric acid. Yeah, luckily we have no organics today. Um, checking for leaks. Oh, um, this is one thing. So solubility in water, a solution may or may not be colored, but must be transparent. For it to be soluble, a uh, cloudy milky suspension is not a solution. I have a, a slide for that here, essentially. So solution, transparent, meaning you could see through it. Um, a suspension means that there's, there's particles that have formed up. And in fact, the, um, the aluminum hydroxide is a good example because these are little molecules. And molecules, they don't do anything until they collide with another molecule. So when they collide, if they're going to form precipitate, they'll collide and stick. And in the entire solution, they're doing this, they're meeting up, they're joining together, colliding and sticking. And so you sort of get throughout the whole solution stuff sticking and making it cloudy appearance, which is a very common precipitate. It's just sort of cloudiness. And so that's what happened there. If it enough gets clumped together, it can even sink to the bottom. Or if you let it hold still, it'll sink to the bottom. Um, but if things are transparent, oh, my wife is telling me to hurry up because the kids must be done with their bath. Transparent is fine. So you can see a color and it can be transparent, meaning you can see through it. That would be a solution versus the precipitate and things like that. 
Um, that's a suspension. Wafting. Make sure you waft when sniffing things. Wafting means don't stick your nose in it. I will smack you. Okay, I won't really smack you, but I'll want to smack you um, if I see anyone sticking their nose in a test tube or bottle or anything to sniff it. Um, so you hold it away from you and you just want to like breeze the fumes towards you. That way you only get a little, little passing flavor of whatever it is. We talked about amphoterism. Okay. I might be missing something, but the kids are going to be unleashed, unleashed from upstairs. So I've got to go for now, but that concludes our pre-lab lecture. Uh, look for some supplemental material because again, uh, I, I love teaching you guys because you guys ask such good questions. Uh, there's some topics that are actually left over from the previous lab where I got some good questions and I want to um, clearly explain some of that stuff. And there uh, might be some things that you don't need to know to complete this lab, but are cool and additional things. And um, while you don't need to know them to help them help you complete the lab, they'll be beneficial and helpful in understanding what's happening in lab. Um, and I'll make a supplemental video later, uh, probably after kids are in bed. So thank you guys. Have a good day.